tree of itself, duplicating the two side parts of the bigger tree, leaving the subtree fixed on the bottom. So these sections here, this and this, get duplicated. Let me identify, let's call these different things. Let's call this piece U. That's the piece on the left side that's way out of the whole tree. V is the part that gets duplicated on the left. W is the part that gets duplicated on the right. No. <laughs> w is the part in the middle. X is the part that gets duplicated on the right. And Y is the part that sits outside there. So every one of these strings is split into five parts. The U and the Y that sit on the outside of the whole big tree. The V and the X that are inside the big tree, but outside the smaller inner tree, and the W that's inside the smaller inner tree. The V and the X are the pieces that get duplicated every time. Or removed. Or removed, right, because you could just take this out, right. In other words, you get at that zero pumping like you have the other times. Don't use the loop at all. Don't use the smaller tree at all. Absolutely. You can definitely take the... Use only that smaller tree, right. Don't use the right. Don't use the side parts at all, right. Take the smaller tree and just put it back there. And that just takes away the V and the X. So you can have a pumping of zero times. Absolutely. In other words, one, one, zero, zero, one should be in this language. All right. Uh, I want to write this puppy lemma down formally, but I just know when I do that that everyone will just go into, all right, let's wait till the example. So let's do the example first, then I'll write it down formally after we've done at least one example of it. Let's use this to show that there's some set that isn't a context-free grammar. Do you know any such sets that aren't context-free grammars? Does every set we ever tried end up being a context-free grammar, context-free language? What do you think? What can't you do with a context-free grammar? The WW? Yeah. yeah, that's not. Um, that's, a, that's OK. We can use that one. I want to use a simpler one, one that's a little easier. Any others? It's true. WW is not a context free language. Not CFLs. Here's the classic, simplest not CFL 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 0 to the n three counts instead of two counts. If you do the normal thing, pushing these and popping these, then you're a little dead when it comes to checking that there's as many zeros as the ones you just checked for equality, because you popped them off and they're gone. You can go back if you had a two-way machine and handle this, but, but we don't have two-way. So there's no obvious way to do this. If I made any of these m not dependent on the others, then it would be easy to do. Right? You just read it as many zeros as you want at the end. But if they all have to be equal, you can't do it. Let's use this idea of a pumping limit to prove that you really can't. Not just our gut instinct, but there's really no way. You go home and work as hard as you want, you'll never do it. So let's do that. OK, so I'll leave Chris Walker alone since he's been working hard on these impossible problems. And I'm sending you, Mr. Radcliffe, home to do the impossible. So Jeff goes home, and he talks to his wife, and he says, Shai gave me this really, really important problem, and I have to work on it. And it's very important, and you need to help me. And she says, leave me alone. You do it yourself. And he comes back the next day, and boom, he's got an answer. And I want to know how many non-terminals are in your grammar after you've turned it into Chomsky normal form. So pick a number. Four. four. So Jeff has four non-terminals in his Chomsky normal form grammar. That means I got to pick a string that is uh, bigger than, say, 2 to the fifth is plenty big. All right? So I'll pick something 2 to the fifth or bigger. Probably 2 to the fourth, 17 might be OK, but certainly this is big enough. So I asked Jeff first what his number of non-terminals is. Then I say, look, I'm going to give you a string longer than this length just because I know that if I do that, you're going to have to have this duplication occur. And he agrees. We have this discussion. He's been here today, and he, and he understands this. And he says, yeah, OK, I know there's going to be that duplication. Fine, go ahead, give me the string. So here's my string, 0 to the um, 32, 1 to the 32, 0 to the 32. OK, that's my string. Now look, when you write these proofs up, you can write it more formally. You can write it in a Dimitri way. Dimitri is a mathematician. He can write proofs. 
none of you are really mathematicians. It is harder for you to write proofs. So it is OK to write this proof just like we're doing it now. You can say, Jeff goes home and he tells me that his machine has four symbols. So I say to him, I'm going to give you a string that has more than 32 symbols because like we talked about in class, there's that tree and there's going to be that duplication. So I'm giving him this string, 0 to the 32, 1 to the 32, 0 to the 32. And then I ask him, Jeff, tell me which one of your symbols is the duplication. And then he tells me how that looks. Now, you can just write that out in English. It's a perfectly fine proof. And actually, it convinces me that you understand it much better than if you try to imitate um, a more formal proof that you don't really feel is your language. Don't try to do the formality unless you feel like it's a convenience. If you feel like it's just something to do because it looks like the right answer, don't do it. Just write it in English. I'm, I'm completely serious. It's very important. All right, so look, you're looking at this. And now it's back to Jeff. I gave him the string. It's his turn. How is he going to tell me what this looks like? He can give me a picture. He can write it on the board. But there's a more specific thing he's got to tell me. He's got to tell me what piece of this string is the U, what's the V, what's the W, what's the X, what's the Y. If he does that, then I don't care what the picture looks like anymore because I've got everything I need out of that. All I'm really going to get out of the picture is where the U, V, W, X, and Y are. So that's what I'm going to ask him right now. I'm saying split this into the five parts and tell me where these five parts are. Now, oh, here's why you go from the bottom instead of the top. There's a criterion that he has to meet. Remember we started from the bottom when we found the first duplication? So there's a limit on how big this VWX part is. This VWX part comes after the first duplication. So that means the tree, the size of the tree, is limited by a tree that's at most you know, n plus 1 height. So essentially, this VWX part is going to be less than or equal to that 2 to the fifth number. So that's one criterion. He can split it any way he wants into five parts, but the middle section, the VWX section, must be smaller than, than that 2 to the n, than that 32. And if we go the other way, we don't have that condition. It's much harder to do your proofs if you can't nail Jeff down and say that that middle part's got to be small. Is that? You're willing to buy that a little bit? Yeah. All right. You want to buy some dustless chalk? <laughs> All right, that's what I want to hear. I want to hear mistrust. <laughs> All right, so Jeff splits this into five parts, u, v, w, x, y. And the v, w, x part has to be smaller than 32 symbols or equal. Okay, v, w, x, length of it is less than or equal to that 32. And by the way, the v and the x, they can't be empty. There's got to be some real v and x here. So I'll say the v, x part has got to be at least as big as one symbol. One of these could be empty, and I could do examples to show you how that happens, but you can't have both of these be empty. How come you can't have both of them be empty? Because then it's not a duplication, it's just the inner tree sitting at the bottom. Right, because this has to split into two parts at the top duplication. One part goes down to the duplication, the other part goes out to something else. The other part is going to actually exist. That's going to be the V or the X. This part doesn't have to exist, right? I mean, the, the, the x could, well, one of them could actually not exist if this a, say I put the a on the other side. I switch this around. Then the v and the x get mushed together, and there's no other part to the right of the a. It's possible one of the sides can disappear, but it's not possible for both of them to disappear. All right, that's a technicality, but it results in this. The sec the middle part's got to be smaller than or equal to 32. The v and the x on either side can't be empty. They've got to be at least 1. All right, so he's done this. So now he can do this any way he wants. From my point of view as the prover, I've got to be ready for anything here. So I'm going, to, I'm going to let you change your mind as often as you want here. But you pick anything you want. You can split this up any place you want. So let's, being ready for Jeff's you know, shenanigans and, and difficult way of splitting things up into five different parts. Let's consider all the possible places where this VWX might show up. And let's think about the end game. Once he pins down where he wants the VWX to show up, I'm going to tell him how to pump the V and the X to convince him that it gets a string that is 